invites. Yeah. Hey, hey, guys. Cool. Thanks for coming. Welcome. Sorry about the mix up. We switched computers the last minute. One didn't play well with the HDMI, so <laughs> you know how it goes. So today, uh, we're going to do something fun. First of all, let me ask, how many here have ever needed to reverse engineer something in FinTech? Like a scraping, anything like that? OK. I, as I've gotten into this space, you know, it's one of those things you do that you think, maybe I'm the only one doing this. And then the more you talk to people and learn about it, the more you realize that's a lot of how FinTech runs, <laughs> is reverse engineering. Um, until there's a better way to do things, right? The classic example would be with Plaid, um, reverse engineering lots of banks. Eventually, there's OAuth and better things. But until then, this is a kind of a crucial skill to have to be able to get to where you want to go. Um, so today, we're going to go through some of the uh, basics and maybe some more advanced stuff on reverse engineering, depending on how far we get. And the goal here is that each of you will have the opportunity to actually reverse engineer an API, in this case, Domino's Pizza. And you can, by the end of this, order pizza to the hotel on, on us, on our card, and uh, get all the way through the process of reverse engineering something. So if you don't feel like coding today or getting into the weeds, probably is not the best place for you. But if you want to get into it, this is going to be a good, a good spot to be. So. Uh, I'm Scott Weinert, uh, co-founder and CTO at Atomic. Um, and I'm here joined with Michael. Do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, I'm Michael Contreras. I do the security research. So I'm basically doing all the reverse, reverse engineering of the APIs. Yeah. For Atomic. Michael's a little bit humble. He's won over a million dollars in reverse engineering competitions uh, in prize money. He's, he's pretty legendary when it comes to this stuff. So <laughs> if you ever want to pick his brain on something after this, he'd be a good person to pull in on a problem you're trying to solve. We're lucky to have him on our team. Um, what makes us qualified to talk about this? Uh, at Atomic, we have built integrations with hundreds of payroll systems. Um, we work with uh, many of the top neobanks. If you open up like Robinhood or Chime or you know, something like that, you'll see us inside of those apps. Um, and so building all those integrations, you can imagine the variety that we encounter, anything from you know, uh, nice APIs to work with to actual screen scraping. Um, it's all over the place. So that's one of the reasons that you know, we're qualified to talk about this topic. Uh, we'll do about 15 minutes on presentation, and then we'll jump into uh, you know, handing some time over to you to, to get your feet wet. And then we'll also be here to help you and maybe drop hints along the way, uh, assuming you know, seeing how, how this is going for everybody. So what is reverse engineering? It's basically understanding something at a really deep level to where you can recreate it yourself. What do you need? Well, you need patience and observation. That's something we throw around a lot internally. You just need more patience and observation, kind of a, a term we use. You need to accurately match behavior. Uh, and you need tools to make the process easier. A little bit on the, on the patient side, this is a very detailed work, a lot of nuances. The nuances is what is going to make this work or not work for you. So it's all, it's getting into those really nitty gritty details and being patient with yourself because it's probably not going to work on your first attempt uh, and you really just have to keep at it. And as you keep at it, you start to build a little bit of intuition on what to try next. And you know, it's kind of like debugging, like debugging as a skill. You start to develop some intuition as an engineer how to do that. Reverse engineering is very similar to debugging. So some of the things to look for when I say accurately match behavior is you have a request going out. There are all kinds of things that go along with that request. You've got headers, you have a protocol, you've got query strings, and a whole lot of other stuff. And so really being able to dissect what are the critical parts of this request uh, is, is fundamental to reverse engineering. So matching headers. Um, so one of, the, one of the things that we like to do is just you have a request and you, you, know, you basically strip out everything initially. So you, you strip out all of the headers and everything that might be going into it to try to distill it down to what is actually necessary to complete that request. 
Um, so you can slowly and additively add a header, header by header back in until you get a different response back. It's a great way to like kind of probe and figure out like what headers actually matter um, and which, one, which ones don't. There's a whole lot of headers out there. A lot of them don't. Most of them won't matter. But being able to key in on the ones that do, maybe you could just blindly send them all. But it's really important to understand which ones matter because when things don't work, which they won't sometimes, if you want to debug that, going back to your understanding of what parts are, are critical of this request is really important. Um, so sometimes refer and origin can be important. Also things like x dash something is typically a header that's uh, you know probably going to be proprietary to that system. Like in our API, we have x dash API key and x dash API secret. Things like that would be great things to pay attention to as well. Um, but really, there's no one single thing. There's really just the principle of looking really closely at these things. Um, there's also the the protocols. Um, so there's tons of versions of TLS. It, you know, Michael, if you want to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so like, you know, when you hit an HTTP, HTTPS server, they have TLS 1.2, 1.3. Some servers won't let you in unless you're exactly matching what they're looking for. And then there's things like the TLS extensions, like ALPN, which negotiates whether they're going to use HTTP 2 or HTTP 1. And if you're not using the same thing they're expecting, some uh, web ac application firewalls will just block your request. Or they'll send you back to the home page, or they'll do something weird and you just won't know why it's working. It's just because you're not matching the behavior exactly. Yeah, and it's something we've encountered. That's why we're mentioning it. Yeah. Uh, so if you're using, like, say, an API library like Axios, uh, it might be actually pretty limited in terms of what HTTP versions it can actually use. Far more limited than something like Google Chrome, right? right? So it's going to be really hard to replicate what Google Chrome is doing within Axios due to their HTTP limitations, and then you're waiting for a pull request into Axios to actually be able to enable what you're trying to do. So just an example. Uh, there's a lot of additional details. Uh, you know, one of the things is checking if sometimes they're adding headers inside of JavaScript, so, you know, which is client side. So if, if you're not, you know, you know, rather than using like the set cookie or set headers from the server side request, they're actually doing it on. So you may need to actually dive into their JavaScript to figure out how those headers are being added and what they are. Um, another thing is matching timings. So if you're just hitting the API in, in a very anomalous way where you know, the requests are just subsequent rapid fire to a sophisticated system, that's going to look like anomalous behavior. And it's a great way to kind of you know, look like a bot. <laughs> and then you end up having to deal with Google reCAPTCHA or something you don't want to deal with to get to where you want to go. Um, another thing would just be proxies in general. Most of them will take, and if you, don't, if you aren't aware of what a proxy is, it's essentially like you know, routing all of your traffic instead of through you know, your server or your device through some type of data center where you have access to potentially thousands of IP addresses or more. Um, they have a tendency to change your IP address all over the place, and they're trying to you know, keep you anonymous. But in reverse engineering, a lot of times not, that's not what you want, because is a real user's IP address going to be changing <laughs> rapidly? Not really, right? And maybe if they're on a cell phone hopping towers, you know, they might change a little bit. But all the IP addresses are going to geolocate to a pretty you know, approximate location. And so it's best to actually keep an IP address. If you're using like a, a proxy server, use a sticky IP address that'll stay with you along your journey so that it actually replicates real user behavior. As far as tools go, you know, like we mentioned, proxies, uh, there's, there's mobile app analysis tools and general tools. A couple, of, a few that we'll mention on the proxy side, um, there's MITM proxy. It stands for man in the middle proxy. Um, there's Charles proxy. There's proxy man. There's a bunch of these. Man in the middle will really run on any, you know, any device, Windows, uh, Mac OS. Charles proxy is more for the folks that are using Mac OS and they want kind of a nice uh, GUI on top of things, that, that can be a preference, and then it's proxy man. Um, usually what you, in the installation process, you have to be able to interrupt SSL traffic as well. And so um, as you do this, you'll likely need to install some type of root certificate on your device to get visibility into that traffic. Yeah, so sometimes websites won't exist and they'll just have a mobile app. And so the only way to find out what APIs are hitting are either with the proxy or if they're obfuscating stuff or you don't know how something is generated because it's just, you just see the back end, you don't see how it works. You're going to need some of these tools to like decompile the application, see, how, see the code, see how it works. 
Uh, objection will let you patch the, AP, the APKs so you can do the SSL pinning removal. So you can then install a proxy to see how the traffic works. Frida is, is uh, the back end for objection and APK tool is like the Google tool for decompiling APKs. We won't be doing mobile stuff here, but if you ever get deeper into it, that's probably what you're gonna need to look at. And then some more general tools for API stuff is Postman, which lets you do API requests pretty easily with the graphical interface. And then the other two are more advanced, Gitra and IdaPro are more for like desktop software reverse engineering for like, when you don't have the code, you can open it up and it'll show you the assembly. Some of them have decompilers. Uh, that's the more advanced stuff, but good to know. Good to know the tools of the trade. Yeah, if you can read assembly code, yeah, that's impressive. <laughs> but sometimes it actually requires that. It's putting those things together. So there are tools for that out there. Um, they're, they're pretty fun to play with. Great. So we'll do a, a quick uh, demonstration of just some of the, you know, piecing some of these things together. I'll do a really s a simple example. Um, we, uh, we had to switch computers, so you'll have to bear with me. Some of the tools might not be uh, exactly what I would use on my own. But um, I'll go to Firefox, and let's just open up a new tab. Let's just do Giphy, okay? Keep it simple here. Um, if I go to, probably many of you are familiar with the, with the network inspector. Um, so, and I refresh this page, there's a, whole lot of, there's a whole lot of requests that come up here, like so. Um, you can see there's some post requests, some get requests. I'm gonna go ahead and clear these out, and I'm just gonna search uh, for pizza and see kind of what comes up. So it looks like it's making a whole, a whole bunch of requests here. Um, so there's a search, uh, search with some query strings. Um, interestingly, it looks like they're doing, if I expand these a little bit, doing a number of these, and the API key for these, uh, it looks like it's embedded inside of the, the query string here. So if I go to the, um, the cookies, there's not really a lot of cookies involved with this. Um, one nifty thing you can do here is you can actually, um, you can copy this request as, as curl. So this is really nice if you if y'all have used curl. It's like you know command line making raw re raw requests. And if I really want to get better visibility into this, I can use something like Postman here, and this lets you import that request. So I'll just I'll just go ahead and paste the raw text of the request and hit continue, import, and you can see here uh, it broke out my query parameters. So it looks like my query was pizza. I have some API key, and that's the URL. Um, I'm going to go ahead and send this request again, but my resolution is a little bit small here. Let's see. There we go. OK. So I got this. I got all kinds of, of, of data back. Um, looks like among the things that came back are going to be actual links to, to, the video, to the GIFs that came back. That's excellent. Uh, MP4 size, all kinds of information. Now, what if I were to change this and just say, hey, we want to find cats? So URL, great, cats will eat you. So there's all kinds of, um, you, can, you can go ahead and kind of manipulate this request, change the query. And now, I'm, I'm pulling back, they essentially have an API behind that website that I'm able to use. And I could query this directly. Instead of going through the interface, I could technically build my own front end on top of this, right? Technically, and maybe I have to, have to maybe understand like some of the things to look out for is how is this API key generated, right? When is that given to me in the requests? Like there's things like that that you'd want to pay attention to, but as you kind of drill deeper into this, you can see how it's pretty easy to, um, to kind of leverage the API directly to do whatever you're going to do. And there's lots of things, uh, lots of things you can do with that. Some of them are for fun, some of them are for, for profit. Um, an example would be, um, our, a company I built before this one, we did, uh, we did integrations with bill pay providers. So if you think of all the merchants out there that you can pay, whether it be uh, you know, a subscription service like Netflix or you're paying Comcast for utility bill, we had reverse engineered 5,000 of these merchants. Uh, and you can imagine what that looked like. We had to really pick up on like what patterns do you need to basically spin up new integrations with things very quickly. 
Um, so in 2017, we, we sold that company to Q2, which is a publicly traded banking software company out of Austin, Texas. Um, and over time, you can imagine the, the amount of investment it takes to reverse engineer all those is enormous. Like nobody wants to build that from the ground up, right? So it becomes a very acquirable target. Uh, so there's a lot of things that can be done with these skills to build real value. Um, today, I mean, you know, one of the questions we get asked is, you know, do the payroll providers care that we're doing this, right? We, we talk to many of them and they're very amenable to the solution and on board with our mission. And there's an open dialogue happening. So, you know, um, you'd be surprised. And some of them, you know, early on, let's say a big, a big cell phone provider, you know, the things they care about are like, hey, I, I get what you're doing, you're helping us get paid, right? So they, they, they stand to gain by, by this. And they're basically like, if you could do it, you know, maybe in these hours and not all at once, <laughs> we'd be, we're, we're cool with it, right? So um, a lot of times companies are very, there's some upside for them as well, assuming there's kind of a win-win. You can build a win-win using reverse engineering for whoever you're integrating with. Great. So now it's your turn. We're gonna reverse engineer the Domino's API. Don't use shortcuts. We saw some things on Terra. You can spin up like a Terraform that orders pizza for you, run the scripts. Don't cheat. <laughs> We're here to learn. Um, don't SMS into Domino's. Let's actually do this. Uh, you can replicate the order flow. So if you go to dominoes.com, you know, use some of those, what, kind of what I just showed you on this tiny resolution. Hopefully you have more pixels than I did, um, where you can actually you know, have panes. And go ahead and look at what requests are required. What, are the, what does the body look like? Copy it as curl, put it in Postman. Uh, speaking of which, if you don't have Postman, download it. You could probably do it without it. You could use curl directly. Um, but it's going to be a lot easier to see what's going on if you use some type of tool like that. Um, you can use a proxy tool, another great way to get kind of better visibility if you don't want to use the inspector inside your browser and be dissecting those network requests. And yeah, reverse engineer for pizza. Um, when you get to the point where you are kind of ready to do a victory lap and you feel like you're there, we, you're going to be needing four numbers for this credit card. So let us know. We'll come over and approve uh, and give you the magic numbers to actually get in and make it happen. Um, and we're happy to come around and help anyone with you know wherever they're at. If it's just getting started or you're getting stuck on something, um, we're here. Michael and I are here to help you. And um, and we'll depending on how things are going. Like I said, we might drop some hints. So yeah, laptops out. There you go. And uh, let's have some fun. Yeah. Questions. Yeah, it's on us. We're gonna buy you pizza. As pizza as you want. As many pizzas as you want. Use you. What's that? Yeah, you might if you if you're clever, you might be able to schedule the order for later at a time where you want. Right? I mean, we, I, there is the ability to do that, uh, and also the you'll see in Domino's the the JSON structure they use for actually like your ingredients is kind of fascinating. Challenge you to like without without like look like look at the JSON structure and try to figure out like what why would the developer structure it this way because it's really wild. <laughs> Tell us because I don't know why they did it that way. <laughs> Interesting. Any other questions? Yeah. Can you order what? Uh, let me know what you have in mind. I'm hoping that, you know Pizza Hut has an API too. But if you're like, hey, I'm going to go on Zappos and order myself a new pair of Jordans, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it'll be active. We'll disable it after this uh, workshop. Yeah. And it's limited to Domino's right now. So. Yeah, good question. It is, it is one of those ones that we have locked down to a merchant. So sorry, guys. But, and and we, you need the four numbers, man. So you got to talk to us. we got to see your request. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I love, how, I love the thinking, you know, the reverse, and, hey, what, what else can I do with this card? That's, you know, yeah. great mentality. But any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, right now. It's a workshop, right? We're supposed to work. Yeah.
I'm not a lawyer. I think this is where I say, say I decline to comment, right? Um, it's probably the safest thing to say. It, it, the, I think the answer is way more in depth and complicated than we could dive into here. It, it, I think it really, it's definitely a big, it depends on what you're doing, you know, your intention, why you're doing it. Those are all things that are going to, you know, be in place there. So, um, yeah, it, it just depends on the use case. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Domino's is going to be happy about this event. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll clarify on that. So um, a real user is going to have a persistent IP address, right? Now, if you are, uh, say, say you're crawling LinkedIn profiles, if you crawl 100 of those in a minute, is that a rate that would be anomalous? Would a regular user be able to do that? Absolutely not, right? So now your IP address is going to get flagged for suspicious activity. So when I say use, this, use the same IP address, I'm referring to when you're going through a flow, say a sign up process or something like that. It's probably not likely your IP address is going to change on each, each step of that process, right? So you'd want to use the same one for each session. If you're going to go through that sign up process a thousand times, one IP isn't going to cut it, right? That's going to look anomalous. It's going to look suspicious very well, should look suspicious. And it's pretty easy to pick up on that stuff, and those IP addresses will get, that IP address would get banned, right? And maybe if it's not even a legal concern, they could just be concerned about the load on their servers, right? You could, that could look like a DDoS attack, right? And so that's uh, something that, you know, they are entitled to protect themselves against that. Sure, yeah. Yeah, we can go over that. Yeah. You want to take his question? Oh, OK. You can go talk to him. Cool. Who uh, needs some help just getting started? Come help you out. So this would be, you're just, you're just going to go through. Um, yeah, yeah, that would be an interesting angle, like reverse engineering the chatbot. I haven't done that before. Um, but you can see, so for example, with with dominoes, right? So there is a there is a way to do this authenticated or unauthenticated, right? I could sign into an account. So you can see here's like a um, if I sign in, there's this they use GraphQL, right? So you can see what that request looks like, including the including what query they're using, right? So, you know, something like that. There's also, so you, it's up to you how you want to do it. You can do it kind of outside the bands and authentication or with an authentication. Or the chat bot would be really cool. I haven't seen that done. That'd be super interesting. Do they need the credentials up in order to be able to authenticate something? Yeah, it's, that's good. Oh, yeah. They won't, they won't need that until they're like finishing the process.
we've informed the front desk that there might be some pizzas coming. So.
just started. I just opened a Gusto account like a month and a half ago and provided some checks. And, uh, no, a lot of it's still, a lot of all my stuff still on my credit card. Uh, I'm just moving it all over, but it's just like growing the team. It's like you grow a company where you're like worried about all the camera apps and stuff. Yeah, I need to see it a little bit. Hey, uh, just a, a point of clarification. Um, what we'd recommend is there's a lot of parts to start this process. We'd recommend getting to the spot where you're actually creating an order. Um, so there's an API request that's validate order, right, that you're going to see. And you get back an order ID that's going to be in the payload. Go start there and see if you can get to the point where you're getting all the way into uh, placing the order. And there's some API requests in between. There's like a payment token request and some of these other ones. So, and you can use a fake credit card. It's going to reject that card. But if, if you get to that point, we can come and fix that issue. If you get to the point where they're actually rejecting your card, that means you're getting close, right? So um, yeah, just a, just a point of, of clarification on that. There's also some other routes like getting nearby stores. This one's a fun one to, to play with. Um, so yeah, just, just a point of clarification. But hopefully that's helpful. We want you to succeed.
So I'm gonna I'm gonna drop another hint um, for the for anyone that's still working on this. Yeah, one second. So after you create the order, um, you're gonna see some requests to create what's called um, a payment token, and you'll notice this one actually hits ACI, so Direct Deposit Acquired at US ACI on Demand, um, and it's the one where you just send you're just sending in your card number and your expiration date. And they're going to give you back this token ID, this pay, and um, that's what you're going to need in the final leg of this to create the order. You need that token ID, um, and that's you'll see it inside the body. This is all this information, right? And the order ID, all that stuff, order amount, and wow. So this this token right here, it'll say token type ACI. That's what we're referring to. So in the, in the actual placing order, you're going to want to, um, yeah, set that up. So hopefully that's helpful. All right, guys, we've only spent probably two or three hundred dollars so far. We got a lot more than that, so let's get rocking, okay? We get, we're going to throw a pizza party for the whole DevCon here. Let's do it. You can, you can order more than one at a time. And don't order something gross. Order something people will like. So we got, no pineapple. We got, uh, this is the tokenization request.
So after you guys figured out, one fun thing you can do is if anyone's created macro keyboards, you can uh, create a, a pizza button on your macro keyboard. So whenever you're hungry at work, you just press it, and pizza arrives at your door. It's pretty fun, especially if it's on your company's card. So when you order the pizza, if you put your number, your phone number in, they're going to call you when it's here because they're not letting the delivery guys up here. So make sure you use a good phone number.
Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, so, a couple things. Um, obviously, the obligatory we're hiring slide. <laughs> Raised 28 million and we're growing like crazy. Like seven of the top 10 neobanks use us. And you can get our deck, our newsletter, with that QR code. And at this point, we also have a, um, a postman collection that you can, you know, as you're trying to figure this out or you want to spend more time on it, we have a postman collection as well that you can get um, in, our, in our Google Drive, and we're happy to share that with you as well. That kind of strings all of this together, all the way from the, from the beginning, like locating a store, potentially logging into your account with GraphQL, like all of this. Um, so you could create some neat things around that. But we want to make sure that everyone here is able to get across the finish line, um, or there's going to be like this unused budget. And I like pizza, but not that much pizza. So <laughs> yeah, please raise your hand, and we're happy to come over and help you get there. We're rooting you on.
Some of it's completely over my head. Like I'm sitting in the break room or something. But I've had a couple of neat ones where I listen to the studio of Reebok and the studio of Nike talk. And like, 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 a little breakout. Like, oh, that's yeah, that's cool. Like, yeah.
Taylor and Fair, I'm going to put on a microphone. I'm putting them in 25, 30 minutes. They're more of a workshop than. This is obviously not what I Yeah, so I think we're, uh, we're up on time. For those that are left here, yeah, we're up on time. But um, if, you, if you want, like uh, this gentleman, what's your name? Jason just had us send in like the Postman collection, which, which he can just import and like string everything together. It's a great way to see how we, str how we kind of tie everything together in Postman. And the nice thing is, you know, once you, once you do that, you can write your code, your actual script that orders pizza or something. If it doesn't work, you can always go back and debug it in Postman, figure out what you're missing, and then bring it back to your code. So it's a really great way to like, keep everything in sync um, and debug things when they're broken. And you know, Postman, it's much easier to iterate on something in Postman than it is like, inside of your code base, right? So we always try to keep like, a really organized copy of our integration inside of Postman so it's easy to translate back into code. Hey, more pizza coming in here, nice. Um, but if you think about it, guys, like. The, the reason this is so cool is you can literally, you can reverse engineer pretty much anything. Like your imagination, let it run wild in FinTech. Like any, you know, if say, if I reverse the, the 20 systems that do X, like you're essentially generating a new product where there's one API that potentially houses or connects to tens or hundreds or thousands of APIs. And entire companies are built on that that are worth billions of dollars. And that's, so it's really, it's a really fascinating space. Um, and even if it's just like, a personal project or like you're at your company and you guys need to integrate with something that doesn't have an API, like this is the reverse engineering is, is a great method to do it. And it, it, we do it, everyone does it in production all the time. If you start asking people, almost everyone in this room raised their hand that they've done it before in FinTech. So it's like, you know, it's, it's a great approach. And um, anyways, thanks for your time. Hope you enjoyed, enjoyed it. That's awesome. <laughs>